Welcome to this week's fireside chat from Kincardine United Church. This is where I reflect on current events from a faith perspective using humor, videos, and a blessing. Thanks to the skills of Mary and John Phillips, the technology flows smoothly as they record it all. Then Terry Boyd uploads the recording to our YouTube channel. Thank you, Terry, John, and Mary. To start with some fun, Halloween is the theme for these images. For those who love the beach, here's something to consider. I must admit, I love the Adams Family TV series in my youth. I also love the streaming series Wednesday, and I make no bones about that. This looks so cool, but I wonder how it looks at night. For those of us who hate cleaning the house, remember when the pandemic was first declared? and the ridiculous shortage of toilet paper. With lots of sweets for Halloween, we need to be careful. You see, a pumpkin spice latte has 380 calories. A glass of red wine has 120 calories. So choose wisely, my friends. And my sister went shopping for a new sectional last week. The furniture salesman told her that this sectional will seat five people without any problems. My sister grinned and wondered, where am I going to find five people without any problems? I've been told our perception of the world is all about attitude. The difference between a good day and a bad day is your attitude, but I would claim that that is a lot more complex than some sanctimonious quote on the internet would claim. However, anxiety is high for many today. Consider this, however. Just because things could have been different doesn't mean they would have been better. Perhaps it's better when we enjoy the space between where you are and where you are going. Of course, many of us compare ourselves to others, especially in this age of social media airbrushed perfection. When we struggle, remember that we all go through the same stuff differently. In fact, I would claim that we need to pay attention to our feelings. People don't wanna be talked out of their feelings. People wanna be heard, seen, felt, understood. Isn't it odd that we can only see our outsides, but nearly everything happens on the inside? For many of us, it could feel like emotional Tetris. I try to keep my feelings in order. Why? So when a new one comes, I know how to handle it. But when so many happen at once, they stop making sense. So let me share with you 10 things to remember when you are feeling overwhelmed. Worry never works. Let your worry go. It won't be easy, but try it anyway. Write it down, walk it off, shifting your thoughts as you keep letting it go. Repeat again and again. Two, learn to say no or you will compromise your health, your family, your peace of mind, and the joy of living your life. Three, don't downplay or dismiss your feelings. Trust them. Four, stop apologizing for who you are, but lean into God's direction for your life, which is life-giving, mutual, and joyful. Five, the expectations of others can be overwhelming. Instead, live the life you dreamed about instead of what others force on you. Six, take care of you. Your well-being comes first. Seven, 
practice gratitude for what you do have, even when you feel overwhelmed. Eight, stop keeping score. Give yourself credit for each accomplishment, no matter how small it seems. Nine, unplug, refresh, restore, pray. Ten, be picky about what consumes your energy. I know that all 10 of these suggestions seem like work, and they are work. However, you can rest in God's embrace to strengthen you in whatever situation you find yourself. prisoners in your cells, all you in private hells, Kyrie eleison, all you hungry and ignored, who thirst for something more, Kyrie eleison. so lost but are afraid of being found you who are in chains but are afraid to live unbound carry
Strengthened by God's embrace, assured that there is love enough for each of us and for all of us, that there is no judgment for where we are or how we feel. In that liberation, we no longer need to hide our emotions from others, claiming that we are fine. We should refrain from bottling up our emotions because we need to live them fully so that they don't fester. Those we love may bottle up their emotions, afraid of our reaction. To help liberate those feelings, here is how I would suggest we respond. Say, I'm here. That sounds really hard. What do you need right now? I hear you. Is there anything I can do to help? You matter. Your feelings make sense. I really care about you. Your words are safe with me. I'm not with you to judge. It's okay not to feel okay right now. You're not alone in this because I am here with you right now. And from a faith perspective, we need to stay away from offering religious bromides. We need to really listen. Instead of keeping a stiff upper lip, say, I can see you're hurting. Instead of stating it's for the best, say, Wow, that's really hard. Instead of claiming, I know how you feel, say, how are you really doing? Instead of telling them, God doesn't give you more than you can handle, say, can I pray for you? Instead of stating it's God's will, say, I'm so sorry that that happened to you. Instead of recommending, you should do blank. Say, I don't know what to say. How can I help? Instead of assuring them you'll get over this in no time, say, give yourself time to heal. Instead of dismissing them with, you'll be fine, say, I'm here for you. Following these practices truly makes a difference. You never really know the impact you have on those around you. You never know how much someone needed that smile you gave them. You never know how much your kindness turns someone's entire life around. You never know how much someone needed that long hug or deep talk. So don't be kind. Sorry, don't wait to be kind. Yes, you need to be kind. Don't wait for someone else to be kind first. Don't wait for better circumstances or for someone to change. Just be kind. Because... You never know how much someone needs it. Being there for others is what Jesus modeled for us all, after all. However, I'm often struck by the dangerous narcissism fostered by spiritual rhetoric that pays so much attention to individual self-improvement and so little to the practice of love in the context of community. After all, Jesus prepared a meal for the multitudes to remind us that we feed people not because we believe they deserve it, but because they're hungry. When we feed one another, transformation happens. Consider this. Rahab the prostitute in the book of Joshua was eventually called Rahab the great-grandmother of Jesus in the first chapter of Matthew. Our kind, loving presence through listening provides the environment for transformation. Remember this, though. No one changes unless they want to change. Not if you beg them, not if you shame them, not if you use reason, emotion, or tough love. There is only one thing that makes someone change. Their own realization that they need to do it. And there is only one time when that will happen when they are ready. That's right. They have to be ready, no matter how frustrating that may feel. As well, God is not here to rescue us. As Jimmy Carter has said, God is not my personal valet. God does not build a protective fence around my life, keeping me from trouble, fulfilling my desires, or guarantee my success. However, through prayer, God offers me comfort 
reassurance, satisfaction, courage, hope, and peace. So, yes, seek God's strength for yourself and for a, or another, for each other, to change within God's call. I recently learned about a term called a glimmer. A glimmer is essentially the opposite of an emotional trigger. Glimmers are those micro moments in your day that make you feel joy, happiness, peace, or gratitude. Once you train your brain to be on the lookout for glimmers, the more of these tiny moments you will notice. In fact, now is the time of year to notice the, those glimmers in how we follow the way of Jesus. Halloween is when we get it right. Strangers come to us, beautiful, ugly, old, odd, scary, whatever, and we accept them all without question. We compliment them, treat them kindly, and give them good things. This seems rather Christ-like to me. Those glimmers have a positive effect on our mental health, shifting our mood, bringing our feelings of ease and contentment. Our body responds with positive energy while hope flourishes. We are strengthened for life's challenges and our well-being grows. This video is just about such a glimmer moment. After watching that video, let me share a poem with you written by Donna Ashworth. Joy does not arrive with fanfare on a red carpet strewn with flowers of a perfect life. Joy sneaks in as you pour your coffee, watching the sun hit your favorite tree just right. And you usher joy away because you're not ready for her since your house is not as it should be for such a distinguished guest. But joy, you see, cares nothing for your messy home or your bank balance or your waistline. Joy is supposed to slither through the cracks of your imperfect life because that's how joy works. You cannot truly invite her. You can only be ready when she appears and hug her with meaning because in this very moment, joy chose you. In his book, Anna Cara, Celtic poet John O'Donohue writes, Stillness is vital to the world of the soul. If as you age, you become more still, you discover that stillness can be a great companion. The fragments of your life will have time to unify, and the places where your soul shelter is wounded or broken will have time to knit and heal. You will be able to return to yourself, in this stillness, you will engage your soul. Many people miss out on themselves completely as they journey through life. They know others, they know places, they know skills, they know their work, but tragically, they do not know themselves at all. There are beautiful lines from T.S. Eliot that say, at the end of all our exploring, we'll be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Don't let anyone steal your joy today. You see, knowing ourselves in the journey of life is also rerouting ourselves within God, even in the midst of trouble and tragedy. In the Bible, when Job had everything, he prayed. 
when he had nothing, he still prayed. Prayer isn't about your circumstance. It's about who God is. Indeed, God lives within us through music because music is fully embraced using our muscles, our breath, our mind, and our emotions. It's one of the only activities, it's one of, it, it is one of the only activities that activates, stimulates, and uses the entire brain. Music acts like a magic key to which the most tightly closed hearts open. What if the symphony of life is found in the harmony of those glimmers in life? What if joy's melody pushes aside the silence in our hearts, in our minds, inspiring us to dance to its tune with abandon? Let us allow those glimmers in music to reach deeply within us and heal us for joy. I am shifting the recording of these fireside chats to later in the week, so look for the next one on Wednesday, November the 1st. I look forward to being with you digitally then. Before I go, let me give you an October blessing. Be present. Let the day flow with grace. Expect joy. Be positive. Serve with compassion. Speak only kindness, impart only love. Never forget you're not alone. Give thanks for everything. See goodness in others. As you take that blessing with you, I bid you farewell. Goodbye. <laughs>